everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with uh, former senior U.S. intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today, I have a fascinating guest. Her name is Natalia Holt. She is a journalist and an author, and she's written a series of really fascinating books. One called Cure is about the people who um, defeated HIV. Another called The Rise of the Rocket Girls are about the female human computers who worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. But most recently, and that's the topic of today's conversation, in September, she has a brand new book called Wise Gals. Natalia, welcome to Athio Now. Thank you so much, Jim. You know, that's a very interesting title. What's it about? <laughs> So Wise Gals is about a group of women pioneers at the CIA. These are four women who joined the OSS, so the forerunner to the CIA, and worked at the end of World War II, and then served at the CIA for decades. So it's about their professional lives, the operations they were a part of, and it's also about their personal lives, what it was like to be a woman at the agency at that time, what they went through, and how they really worked together to make the agency a better place for all women. Natalia, building on your success with Rise of the Rocket Girls, what led you to write about these early female uh, trailblazers at CIA? Well, it started about six years ago, I would say. I was interviewing a woman who had worked at liberated concentration camps at the end of World War II. And she had just heartbreaking stories of what her life was like at that time and what her work was like. But she also had these really intriguing stories about a group of women intelligence officers who were Americans. And this really struck me because I love reading World War II books. I read a lot of history of this time period. And I realized that I haven't read about women intelligence officers who then went on and were part of the CIA. And what was so surprising was how many of them there were. So I picked four women to concentrate on for this book. But honestly, it could have been far more than that. This was a really vibrant group who were brought in in these early days in the 1940s and built astounding careers at the CIA. They had incredible success. And the operations they were a part of were really critical to our national security during the Cold War. What kind of difficulties did you uh, encounter in doing the research on these ladies? Well, it was quite difficult because there isn't much publicly available on this group of women. So, of course, first I went ahead and I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the CIA. And then I went and tracked down the women's families, their colleagues and their friends. And I was able to get a lot of great interviews that way. Um, and then after several years, I did finally hear back from the CIA and they turned out to be just wonderful in helping me get documents that were just declassified for this book, um, working through the manuscript with me. I had a historian there who was really fantastic at being able to look at issues with the book and help me figure out specific periods of time. And then, of course, I really couldn't have written this book without your organization. I, I don't know what I would have done without you, honestly. It was wonderful to be able to hear from members of, of AFIO because I heard wonderful stories about what it was like working with these women, what some of these operations were actually like, how they went. And of course, all of these were many decades ago. Um, so to be able to combine these interviews with then documents from the CIA gave me a really full picture of, of what this time period was like. And I, I have to say, you know, I've done so many different interviews in my career, um, in academia, in corporate, and entertainment, and, and all different kinds of government agencies as well. But the members of your organization that I interviewed ha were by far just the most modest people I think I've ever spoken with. Every interview, I, I felt like the person that I was talking to was trying to minimize their own contributions and, and really promote the women that I was writing about. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever had interviews like that before, where someone is, is so intent on trying to make sure that their own contributions um, in history and in national security are, are just made as small as possible in an effort to rise others. It was very touching. 
for our audience, there is a body of information that has now been released by the agency back in 2013 entitled From Typist to Trailblazers, which gives a lot of the history of early female employees um, at the CIA. And you can actually find that on the CIA website. Yeah, I think your points about uh, the modesty of uh, our group in general is unusual, but very typical of people who are in that kind of service. Natalia, were there any similar traits between these ladies? Things, um, even though they had very different backgrounds and very different experiences, were there some similarities? There were. And that's remarkable because the women that I write about are so different. You have Eloise Page, who is kind of your classic Southern lady. She wears white gloves, heels, and pearls. And she's just not the kind of woman that you expect to be part of these operations at all. And then you have Adelaide Hawkins, who is a single mom of three, and she's just desperate for an operation overseas. And you have Mary Hutchinson, who has a PhD in archeology, span who speaks four languages. And when she is interviewed by Richard Helms for a position at the CIA, he offers her the position of secretary. And she just immediately responds with, oh, that would be a waste of my abilities. She's such a strong personality. Um, and she is also an agency wife. Her, her husband uh, is also an officer at the CIA. And so she has to grapple with many issues because of her position. And then, of course, you have Elizabeth Sedmeyer, who is this small town girl from South Dakota and is just has an incredible work ethic and is really determined to get ahead and to do well in these operations and to grow her career. And what I love about these women is that they're all so different. They all have different passions, different interests, different kinds of families, different backgrounds. Their education couldn't be more different. Many of them have college degrees, but some like Addie are just a high school graduate. And yet what really binds them together is their absolute love of country. These are women who worked for the CIA, definitely not for the money and not for promotion, not for their ego. They did it because they really believed in what they were doing. And I see that over and over again in the interviews that were done with them, where you can hear them saying this in their own words, but also in their actions. The, they worked for the CIA for decades um, during conditions that were not always easy. And as I uh, mentioned to you off camera, all of these stories are special, but the one that's particularly special to me is uh, that of Elizabeth Sudmeyer. When I joined CIA's Near East and South Asia Division in spring of 1972, Elizabeth was my first boss. So she was my coach and mentor and really helped a young kid um, get established in what in those days was um, a not very well known and um, pretty hierarchical organization. <laughs> Natalia, what surprised you the most about females at the CIA that you found out from your research? It's a tough question because there were many surprising things. Um, for example, the petticoat panel was really surprising to me when I actually went through those documents and went through what it was like and the transcripts of those meetings. I mean, some of what's said in there is, is pretty shocking for modern ears, not quite so shocking, of course, for the time. But what actually surprised me the most was the story of Jane Burrell. Jane Burrell joined the U.S. government in 1942, and she became an intelligence officer in an elite unit known as X-2 and was sent to Normandy uh, by 1943. She had just an incredible career. This is a woman that was recruiting Nazi intelligence officers, turning them to the Allies' side, and using them in a multitude of operations that made a very big difference at the end of the war. And then after World War II, she continued on and she was stationed in, in several different places in Germany. Then she went back to DC for a bit and then was in France. And she just had an incredible career of tracking down even Nazi gold. She unearthed a, a huge treasure in these hills way out in the Alps. Um, and then in 1949, while on an, on, on an operation involving the Monuments Men, she was in a plane crash and sadly died. Um, and so this actually makes her the first CIA officer to die while in service to our country. And I think what has most surprised me 
is that now that I've, I've documented this, there, I found out that there is just no star for her on the memorial wall. And so my hope is that by really showing all of the paperwork for what she was doing at the time of her death, what she was involved in, um, we can finally get that recognition for her. She certainly deserves it. Good for you. During the course of your research and over time, did you notice any change in attitudes, any better opportunities for women at the CIA? Oh, absolutely. And that was such an interesting part. When you write a book like this that takes place over the decades, you really get to see that change happening in an institution. And so when I wrote about the petticoat panel, so this is the 1953 panel that a group of women at the CIA had, and it was an effort to document how women were being promoted less often and making less money, although they were doing the same work as their counterparts. Um, and the women that I write about, which are these four women in the book, were all on the panel. So they're all together in DC at this time. And they're really forming some friendships, as you can imagine, based on their shared experience. Um, and they are just putting an incredible amount of effort to, to going through the numbers and really showing how women need to be promoted. And I think what's remarkable about this is just, you know, how unexpected this is for 1953. I mean, no other government agency is doing anything like this. No other government agency has this, this number of women who not only are, are having these incredible roles in intelligence operations and, and being given all these responsibilities and working in operations across the globe, but they're also gathering together to try to make the environment better for women. Um, and what you see is that all of the work they did then really ends up paying off in the next decades. Today, of course, more than half of the officers at the CIA are women. And you have an incredible number of women that have been promoted. Of course, you have Gina Haspel, who is the first director of the CIA in 2018. And then today in 2021, you had Avril Haines, who is that's appointed as the first director. Um, and it's it, all of this is really the promise of the petticoat panel fulfilled. I think the woman would be incredibly satisfied to see that the seeds of their work at that time just really come to fruition now and all of the things that have happened since then because of their careers. As some of our audience is aware, it was my privilege to serve as the chief of CIA's Near East and South Asia Division in the early 2000s. And before I left, we actually had several women serving as chiefs of base and chiefs of station in the Near East. And we considered that to be quite an accomplishment, given the history that you've been talking about. Absolutely. And one of the women that I write about, Eloise Page, was the first female chief of station. And she, of course, served in Greece at a time when it was quite dangerous to do so. Um, so it was really interesting to document that period of her history and what that was like for her as well. And, and that was shortly after the Dick Welch assassination, which exactly is actually the first CIA chief of station to be assassinated. Natalia, as I mentioned to you off camera, AFIO does a lot with academic outreach. A part of our audiences are students. Based on your research, do you have any advice that you'd like to provide to young women in the United States who might be considering a career in intelligence? Well, I think it's helpful to know that you are not the first. If you're a young woman looking at joining the intelligence community, you are joining a very long line of women that came before you. You do not have to worry about trailblazing a path um, because so many of the conveniences and, and advances we've made have been done by this group of women. And I think, I think that is helpful when you're joining uh, an agency that does have a reputation for being male dominated to know that there is actually a large group of women that have always been part of it. Well, I want to thank Natalia Holt today. The book is called Wise Gals. It is well worth your time. It's coming out in September, and I hope that you will all get a copy and read it. Natalia, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you so much to the organization as well. I, I honestly don't know what I would have done without you and without all of the help and all the interviews that I've, I've received. I'm really grateful. <laughs>